Well, I mean, uh, the cool thing about uh, Weights and All and co-ops, a lot of our co-ops is we do have these people that are incredibly loyal and they come back one, you know, twice a week or five times a day or however often they, and we see a lot of people a lot. And I really don't want to ever forget that we have those folks. So we can do this. Um, but there, it is getting increasingly uh, difficult to get more than one chance with people. Um, and so these different tools, like we use a tool that we put stickers on our sandwiches to have people text us if we got their sandwich wrong, because we want that chance for the, to fix it if we messed it up. It, because the reality is there's a million places to get sandwiches. And if we forget to put this cheese on one of their sandwiches, like why would they come back? Um, but if they text us and say, I'm really mad and we can make it right for them, then we get them back in again and we can probably get it right. Cause mostly we get it right. But in that one instance, I think that for staff, they're like, well, why are you so picky? Like, so I forgot cheese on a sandwich. And it's like, right. But that is a customer actually that we've disappointed it's so critically important not to disappoint them because they actually don't need to come to us at all. Um, and so we're very lucky that they have chosen to come to us and we need to do whatever we can to preserve them and build their frequency, not like erode it. Looking at things from a customer's perspective. So try as often as you can to look through your co-op and your store and think, how would a customer who's not at the hug stage of our development, they're not, they're not completely bought in how would they experience this interaction? Somebody who's never had popcorn tofu at Wheatsville before, how do we get them to understand how special that is and, and get them into it? And how do we help them shop the bulk department? How do we um, let them know that um, uh, they can shop here even though we're a co-op? And uh, you know, all of these things uh, are looking at it from a customer perspective, walking customers to the product. It's uh, smiling at them, using the 10-4 rule, all these things that in a way seem kind of small, but when someone consistently gets that experience, they start to think this is actually a world-class service operation. Um, and, and, uh, but the challenge with that, it's something that Ari from Zingerman's talks about is once you set a high bar, um, when you deviate from that, it really disappoints people greatly. And so you do set up a challenge for yourself at being a friendly store in town that, if you're not committed to it, if your supervisors aren't training it and teaching it and expecting it, then staff people can fall short of it and you can really end up with a big disappointment of a customer. And so um, there's, uh, there's, it's, not fraught, it's, it's not without its challenges to make sure that you're the friendly store in town and that you're always a little, a living at that high bar that you're setting. Uh, in the great co-op tradition, we stole it from somebody else. Uh, we learned it from Lila at the Durham Food Co-op uh, it was $3 dinner at uh, their co-op. We have $5 dinner at Wheatsville. Once a week, we serve this great meal. And we are serving four to 500 people at each store uh, on Thursday nights. And, um, you know, there's our regular assortment of, of co-op uh, regulars. Uh, but there's also a giant uh, new crowd of people. And uh, especially young people are really uh, finding their way to $5 dinner. Um, and they're hanging out and eating in our stores and, and the, the patio and the community room. And people tweet about how excited they are about $5 dinner and, and they're telling their friends about it and they're bringing their friends to it. And I think that's uh, created a real opportunity for us. And people are also perceiving it as not just um, like a great deal, but they're actually perceiving it as a community service that we're providing to have this really inexpensive, healthy um a filling meal for people and uh, they're, they're finding ways to transmit that what they perceive as our generosity of giving this great deal. Like a woman talked about how she bought extras and brought them to people with living in poverty to, uh, it was a really nice way of uh, that extended generosity, that theory that we have about Wheatsville's big direction of making a difference to people uh, and rippling that out through our customers. If we treat our customers with generosity and hospitality and kindness, they will take that out in the world and, that was an example of that actually happening. Like as a, as a customers can be jerks and they can treat our staff poorly and, or not have not react the way you want them to. So I tell this story about how uh, when uh, chocolate love, chocolate almond sea salt uh, came out a few years ago, we were pretty obsessed with it here. And I uh, saw a customer standing in front of a chocolate display. And I thought, Oh, I'm going to sell this person on chocolate almond sea salt. And, 
she's going to love it so much that she's going to like thank me and like maybe name a kid after me because it's so good. And, and, uh, oh man, I can't, I couldn't wait to just tell this lady about chocolate almond sea salt. It's so great. So I went to tell her and, uh, told her the story, how great it was. And she said, Oh, I don't like salt. And I was crushed because I had set this expectation that she was going to be so delighted with how awesome I was that when she was not, I was crestfallen. And normally I'm really good at customer service. I don't usually falter with whatever kind of reaction I got. But that time, because I had set myself up that I was uh, I was preconce- uh, preconceiving how she was going to react, uh, that I just fell apart. You know, internally, I didn't fall apart in front of her. But I think about that because I think ultimately, like, the we can set this standard that we're the friendliest store in town. And it doesn't matter how people react to us as long as we're doing everything we can to be the friendliest store in town. Oh, you don't like, cho- you don't like salt. Oh, well, I have another chocolate that will work. Um, and, you know, can I help you get that? And uh, we definitely talk about that too, that we do a thing called spontaneous sampling where we just let customers try anything they want in the store. And part of that we tell is like, even if they don't want to buy that item, we're actually glad because we'll return it anyway. So I'd rather they not get it home and have to re- come back and, you know, get a, get a return. Like, just don't buy it. Let's find something that you will like. So there's a chance in that interaction to find just what the customer wants. And uh, that's pretty powerful to have that opportunity and to remember to, to use it. If we have, if we get uh, intrinsic reward out of uh, being the friendliest that we can be, then that's the win for us, regardless of how a customer reacts. And so we try to teach staff that because I think if you go out with an expectation that you're friendly and therefore people are going to love you, uh, you can be disappointed and it can actually erode your desire to strive to be friendly. And so we really try to build this intrinsic sense that uh, being friendly is the right thing to do and being kind is the right thing to do uh, regardless of the outcome. And, And that I think is actually a pretty helpful piece of advice for people to live their life in a way that's productive. And even if they sometimes get a shabby response from a customer, uh, they still, it doesn't make them not want to go out and do it again because the, 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 they, they got the intrinsic feeling of, of good friendliness. It's, it's good to be friendly. It's the right thing to do. And so that's pretty powerful.